Uh, we're thrilled to welcome Jim Messina is here. He's a reading specialist right here on his home turf, um, an adjunct faculty member at Southern Connecticut State University, right, in their, in their reading program. So um, he's going to talk to us about how to get kids hooked on reading, which I am really excited about too, although my kids are a little bit older, but they just don't seem to enjoy the thing. So right. I'm hoping to so get when you change it, you get a tip for keeping kids from them. Yeah, yeah. No, that's no, 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 that's it. Right. I'm just going to close this stuff. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to all of you. Um, I know that this is an incredibly important topic, I think, for us as teachers and uh, as parents. Uh, we want our students to be um, literate. We want our students to be able to function in society. Uh, when I teach the classes at Southern Connecticut State University, I usually open my first classes by telling uh, the students that literacy is a social justice issue, that students being able to read and write and express themselves and learn and understand, it's a vital component um, for them to be able to be full members of society. So I think it's incredibly important for us to, to keep those things in mind. So for tonight, I wanted to just give you some um, ideas and I'd like to hear from you on some of the things that you've seen, some of the concerns you have, some of the things that you do at home that encourage you um, to encourage your children to see the wonderful power of being able to read and, and learn. So we're going, to, we're going to have that. So tonight's agenda, I'm going to start with just a quick poll. What are some of the things that you see that concern you? And we're also going to see, I'm going to ask, what are some of the things that encourage you in terms of um, the literacy habits that you see from your, from your children? I'm going to share some tips on motivating and encouraging readers of all levels, whether they're students who really enjoy reading or students who might be a little reluctant. We're going to talk about how families can best support reluctant or struggling readers, so there's some other tips and strategies that I'll share with you um, tonight as well. I'm going to share some book recommendations, which is, I think, the heart of what this is all about. We need students to read books that they really love, and when they find books and authors that they really care about and love, that's really what's going to spark and keep them going. Um, so we're going to talk about that, and then leave some time for questions and answers as well, okay? So I'm curious to hear from you. What do you see or not see in your child's reading behavior that concerns you? So what are some of the things that, that you see? I have to encourage them to remind them to get their required reading in. Okay. Reading the right kind of books. Say a little more about that. Okay, so I have a sixth, I have a sixth grader, uh -huh. and he, he will quite happily read a big note book 20 times uh -huh. over and over again. Right. But getting him to read something that doesn't have pictures and has more words, that's more challenging. Gotcha. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Sometimes I, when I um, first started as a literacy interventionist, I had students that were picking books that were inappropriate for them too high. They, were, they wanted to read books that were above their level because they aspired to read those, but then when the reading broke down, they became frustrated. So I think it sort of goes both ways, but I think one of the pieces is to get students to move on to something more challenging, which is one of the pieces we'll see. Good. Anything else? No, I guess one of the questions I would have is, are kids just born, are some kids born loving reading, and some kids just aren't? Because like I get, uh, say like, it's a nature and nurture piece, yeah, right? Yeah, you know, the kid that just loves to read, and I don't know, or can you really teach that, you know? And, and I think like her, my kids are drawn to like the Diary of the Kid, which is all pictures, and it's not really getting into the story, I don't think. And okay. I just think they're more drawn to those other screens, you know, and that, that pull that is taking them away from reading. That's a great question, and I, I'll, I'll give you my take on that. I don't know that there, I can share too much of the research base around it, but I think that there, there is some something to be said about okay. that. But I did want to, I just wanted to. Yeah, I have a really big kid concern because my child is 17, and I have a question about. He used to be a very big reader, mm -hmm. and he's still a big reader, but it's audio. It's all audio books now. Right. And he said, "Which is your business? Which yeah. your business?" So that's good. But <laughs> he said recently, I, I, I don't, I don't. Um, I don't focus as much on the, the on, a, on a paper book anymore. Like I get more of it from the audio books, and it kind of freaks me out. I thought I don't want to have a kid that never gets a book and only oh, listens. I, I think as students get older and they, they figure out how they learn best, I think that that is one way. And I think it's it's interesting because um, there are some students, as you said, who for a very long time were very much um, glued to it. And I think technology has a big piece with that. I think students 
have gotten accustomed to getting information in a variety of ways, and I think there's some of that will struggle. But I do have a little bit to say about audiobooks um, toward the end of, the, of, my, of my little talk about it. But I do think that it's, it's valuable, but I think just like any other habit, if, the, if it's exclusively that, I think that it, it takes some away. But I think students are reading a lot more than we, than we think as well. Although social media might not be the greatest method of students, I find that, um, at least in my peer group, I, there are folks who, who share articles from really reputable sources. So folks are uh, uh, excuse me, forwarding me stories from the, from the New York Times, from the Washington Post, from, you know, from sources that I wouldn't probably have read on my own, but because they're sending them my way. And I think that that goes for students as well, as they want to educate themselves. Not that they're all reading The Economist, but they are, I think, being exposed to a lot of different sources of literature. Yeah. Um, I have younger readers, and yeah. um, the two, two concerns that I have is one, I was, uh, my oldest um, can read uh, a lot of words, but when you ask him questions about it, it's very difficult for him to, and, and he does have a diagnosed learning disability, so sure. um, that, that's part of it, but, mm -hmm. um, but also, and then the other thing is, um, this gets back to what they read, like he loves nonfiction and not that interested in fiction. Interesting. It's usually the other way around. Yeah. <laughs> I think we take it. Um, from, uh, from our point of view, I think a lot of the reading that um, children will do as they get older, we see that there's much more nonfiction that students are, are, are being exposed to, whether that's in their high school life, college life, or their <coughs> professional life. So. Um, I think that that's a really good thing because some students, it's hard to get them to flip in the other direction. They exclusively want to read fiction, and having them read nonfiction can be a little bit of a challenge. But I see where I see what you're getting at, and hopefully, some of the things I shared tonight might give you some might give you some ideas. Yeah. Um, to that point, I have had an avid avid reader, you know, tore through Harry Potter at a very young age, uh -huh. and now he just wants to read sports, and sports-related articles, maybe sometimes some books. He is enjoying the. Um, Greek mythology is a freshman, but it's, it's yeah, books, that's kind of slowly down. Yeah, I think, I think for, for many of us, I think there's a time where some of those literacy habits can plateau, and it becomes a little frustrating, but I know for me, um, there was a period, doing my summer reading, uh, I went to Notre Dame High School uh, when I was growing up, and so growing up in West Haven, you know, we were doing some reading, and then summer reading suddenly became a chore. And I, it could be hormonal, it could be that I was more interested in playing on the freshman football team than, than doing that, but I think there were a variety of things that, that came about. Yeah, Mr. Buddy. Yeah, I would say that um, one, of the, one of the biggest challenges that, that I see is that um, during the school day, the kids are scanning for information, and for, for them, that they would say that they're reading. Um, but when you're, when you're looking at a screen and you're looking to hunt for specific information, um, it's a very different skill set and it's a very different way to read than reading a book, and whether it's fiction or nonfiction, and reading for pleasure, where you really need to maintain sustained focus over a longer period of time. That's not the skill set when you're looking for information, whether it's from a textbook or an online source. Very different. It's very true. And I'm I think he's. Well, I forgot to introduce Mr. Thelma Glade. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he's our assistant yeah. superintendent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's one of the crew now. Yeah. <laughs> I know, but he's a regular tenant, so thank you for coming. Sure. Yeah. I have um, a son that is one of those kids that does just love reading, and mm -hmm. like it's almost an escapism sometimes. Like sure. Instead of doing his homework, he's like reading a book for pleasure, which is great in theory, but I notice as he's getting older and the homework is more and there's band practice, and, you know, like mm -hmm. there's less time for that just pleasure reading that he sure. used to really do a lot. So okay. I, I worry about that going forward. He's, a, he's 10 now, so I worry like with middle school and high school homework coming, mm -hmm. that that pleasure reading just might dry up. Um, and I think that, that that is a concern that I think a, a lot of parents have, and I think um, on the teacher side, so before I came to work at Morgan, uh, I worked in New Haven, uh, and I taught fifth through eighth grade for many years, so I worked in middle school, and it was just around that breaking point for many kids as they were trying to navigate and figure out who they, who they were academically, and so I spent some time there, and so it gives me a little bit of an appreciation for the mindset of students as they come into, as they come into Morgan, and I think that that's um, some, some things to keep in mind, and 
Um, again, I'm hoping that maybe some of the points that we talk about tonight might, might give you some insight into, um, into those pieces. So I don't always want to stick with what's the, what's the negative stuff we're seeing, but I think out of what you've shared, I hear some of the encouraging things. Children that are interested in nonfiction, children that are interested in, in online sources, um, children that are really avid readers, even though it might get in the way of some of the academic habits that they have. So there were some other things. But anything else that you wanted to point out that encourages you? Yeah, so I would share that, because um, I had the avid reader, the, the plateau thing that you mm -hmm. just snuck that in there, that I've seen three times in, in his phases. Uh, and, but the most critical thing was right at that switch in that fourth, fifth grade era, switching into a series, getting hooked on a series and then flying through the series and then picking up another series and flying through another series. And that to me was like just at the critical point. I think yeah, that's my daughter is a very avid uh, reader, and she um, actually she was into a series, and uh, she got to the last book, and a new book was coming out. She had to yeah. order it before she sure. you know, it. It was like I gotta get it. And so yeah, I can understand the series. Reading. Yeah, the Harry Potter series was just taking off as I was as I was in my education courses at Central, at CCSU, those books were just really starting to hit. I mean, it was like, oh, what's this Harry Potter thing going on? Well, maybe I'll read it for my children's literature class. And that got me hooked, and then was able to pass that on to many of the students I've taught. Good, yeah. Um, I also have an avid reader a couple of years, but um, one thing that encourages me is that one of them likes to bring a book to the bus stop, and he sits on the ground and he reads, mm -hmm. and the other kids, come and look at what he reads and ask some questions right. about it. Look at that, literacy and leadership. I, I, yeah. <laughs> I think that's really Let me cool. give you my card. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what is that thing? Someday I'll want yeah. to work with him. He's looking at the southern and get a degree. You can have my card someday. Absolutely. That's good. Well, that's, that's, really, that's, that's really a great yeah. thing. And, and I think that gets to one of the points that I'm, I'm going to make fairly early on. So I'm glad to hear that there are good things that you're seeing. and. Again, let's let's see if we can um, go through some of the some of the resources that will be offered. If you've never been to this website before, especially those of you who have younger children, um, Public Television WETA created two uh, uh, two websites that really are chock full of information, and they usually recommend these resources to us as literacy uh, leaders. But we have Reading Rockets, which is has all different kinds of pieces. So there's tips for teaching reading. There's a whole tab just on helping struggling readers. Um, they have reading topics, children's books and authors that they recommend. And what's wonderful um, for, for us is that they also have a companion site specifically for working with English language learners called Colorine Colorado, which um, if I were to translate roughly, Colorine Colorado, can you, can you tell us what the, the best? Um, um, Colorado is red. Right. So when, when in, in, a, in the Spanish culture, when yeah. you're done with the reading, yes. you say, Colorín Colorado, este cuento se ha acabado. Right. <laughs> so my daughter just told me that, that and you said, and I go, yeah. <laughs> so it's the end of the story when you're right. done. So it's, it's, it's as though it's the equivalent sort of the, and everyone lived happily ever after, or and now the story is complete. Mm -hmm. Is that. So these were created by PBS, and there's just great advice and resources. So if you've never been to them, again, it's more geared for um, for younger age children, but there are lots of resources. And um, some of what I'm going to share with you tonight um, comes directly from the Reading Rockets website, because I, you know, I think it's a great source that has really compiled and condensed information into its most essential pieces. So in terms of motivating and encouraging readers, Reading Rockets developed a quick piece, and this is a lot of what I pour into um, the classes when I, when I teach. The first piece, they say, is to read me a story and to read together. That is probably one of the most essential pieces. Children don't learn to be readers in a bubble. They have to have someone model that for them. And so for many children, we are the first readers that they are exposed to because we are the, we are the, we are the families, we're the ones. When my nephew was first born, I loved the first time I got to read him a story. Good night, Moon. He was, he was a teeny tiny baby. He'd just come home, and it was my first time meeting him, and I said, I'd like to read him a book. <laughs> so I think reading together is one of the most important habits. And so um, 
I find that especially with boys, if their father or their brother is reading, they are much more likely to want to delve in themselves. And I think that that goes for both boys and girls, but reading together is, is an essential one. The other tip that I would say is to look beyond books. And I think that for a long time, people minimized comic books, graphic novels, and, and those types of reading, and Diary of a Wimpy Kid as less than. Students are learning story structure when they're reading those kinds of books. They're reading about, they're learning storytelling techniques. They're learning about sneaking things in like humor. Um, and while we don't want them to exclusively read Diary of a Wimpy Kid, I do think that there's something to gain from, from reading those. So looking beyond books is another important piece to keep in mind. And keeping it fun, and I'm going to go back to this a little bit later, that it shouldn't be a trial, it shouldn't be this arduous task that makes everybody miserable when we're asking students to, or children to read. So to keep it fun, create games, act out what you're reading. Uh, when I taught in New Haven, uh, we read The Watsons Go to Birmingham, which is one of my all-time favorite books. And Christopher Paul Curtis, it's, uh, it's listed at the bottom as one of the awesome authors. His book was so easily read aloud that I actually took the time to transcribe it into a play and had the students act out the scenes from the book, and they loved it because it gave them a way to immerse themselves in the story. I think that for especially younger children, if there's some visible record that students can say, look what I did, look at the benchmarks that I've met, look at the progress I've made, look at the number of pages I read, look at the amount of time I spent reading, it gives them another way to um, to impact them and, and see the value in what they're doing. One of the things that is incredibly important, and we'll pour through all of this, is that choice is really the key. So letting students say, I want that one. When they go to the library, yes, there are books you want students to be exposed to, but also giving them an opportunity to choose. And sometimes they pick the book by its cover and they say, oh, I really like that cover illustration, so I'm going to read that one. Um, I know that's what first gravitated me toward the Shel Silverstein books. His illustrations were just amazing. And that's what made me want to delve into poetry. So giving students choice, your children choice, I think is a really important one. Picking books that have topics that can keep the conversation going. Discuss what, what's being read in the, in the books. And I know that for many of us, when children come home and you say, what did you read today? Eh, mm, don't really have a whole lot to say. But when you read together, you can start sharing some of that metacognitive processing. Like, I really wonder why that character made that choice. Why did he go left when everybody else was going right? Having those conversations with children really helps them to open up the book and see it beyond just what's on the written page. It helps them to make inferences and start to really think critically about the choices that authors make. So that's another important piece. And the other piece is just, you know, they say, hey kids, what time is it? family reading time. <laughs> um, but creating those spaces where there is dedicated time to this. And I think a lot of these habits we see, mostly for young children, but I think as, our, as, as the children get older, they still crave many of the things that are on this list. And so you might not keep a, a visible record of how much reading they did in a graph when they're in high school, but <laughs> it's still helpful to say, gold star, Johnny Good Job. Yeah. I know um, when my daughter had to read a book at school, she found that if I was in the room and she read it to me, she was uh, able to comprehend right. the story more. So it was like how she read. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, yeah, just spending time together. And it actually helped her absorb the story and, you know, read too. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's, and that's a piece that gets back to some of the comprehension pieces. Students will be able to read a whole lot, but if they can't turn around and then explain what it is that they read, then we, that's, that's something that we know we want to work on with children. Because it's great if they can read fluently and, they, and their, their prosody is good and everything sounds wonderful coming out, but if they're not really absorbing the content, then that's, that's where our conversations with them can really be a big help. And so it's good that you're creating sort of that family community time where you're, where you're spending some time on that. Any, any thoughts or questions or feedback about, about that? So like I know like I'm in high school and like I haven't had time to read like a book for pleasure since summer reading. Right. So like how could I like manage my time in order to like because like I want to read books like for pleasure mm -hmm. and I just like I don't have time because like I'm in a couple honors classes and like that takes up a lot of my time. I have a lot of homework. Right. So like that's like one of the struggles I have overall. So part of what I would recommend would be to, to reward yourself. If, you, if you're able to accomplish a certain number of homework assignments that you would want, if really 
being able to delve into a chapter or two of a book yeah. that you've really been looking forward to, reward yourself. I mean, I think oftentimes we think it has to be something different, but hey, if you just if just going outside and sitting on the ground and reading a couple of yeah. chapters of a book is what helps you repair yourself and recharge so that you can go back in and do more work, I say go for it. Um, but I know that it is challenging because we are sending, I think, some of our students a mixed signal. We want them to be literate people, but you're going to read this part now because that's what we're really um, focusing on. But I think creating that balance for yourself is so critical. We have this conversation a lot with students at the high school is striking a balance between the work. And there is a lot of work because the expectations are that there's going to be a whole lot of expectations beyond, beyond the high school life. But I think, even as adults, taking the time to read something for pleasure. Um, there was a time when I was doing my coursework at Southern where that's all I was reading were professional articles or you know, uh, theory books, and I thought, what I wouldn't give to just sit down and read a good old-fashioned novel right now. And so making some time for yourself, I think, is a really an important one. Um, so I hope, I hope that you'll be able to, to, to do that um, for yourself and take a break. Anything else? Okay. So um, I'm going to take a, a short little segue from what um, we had put in the description for tonight. I just, but before I do that, um, one of the pieces, and this comes from Reading Rockets, is recognizing the difference between an emotionally turned off reader and a child with a learning problem. And so for many of us, I think sometimes when we see resistance to reading, our first inclination is that maybe, it's, maybe there, there's an underlying issue there. And so part of what, and this is again, mostly for younger children, um, is to go to the library and ask the librarian for books that would be appropriate for your child's age. And if your child can read it and understand it, then that can help you to think about whether or not it's a motivation issue or if there really is a, an underlying learning issue. And so if kids complain about stomach aches, that they don't like going to school, that they don't like reading anything, then it could be an indicator that there is a struggle with, with the child's reading habits. And so there are some things that would indicate that there could be an underlying issue, but other times it's that students don't really get the same kind of pleasure out of reading that we might. And this goes back to your nature versus nurture piece. Are students just naturally inclined, or is that? And I think that there are some students, um, I taught students who, I had brothers and sisters who had no, no interest whatsoever, and yet that kid always had a book and always wanted to be reading. So I think there's always going to be individual differences with, um, with children. Um, but it's important to, to be on the lookout for those pieces and to have conversations with, um, with your teachers. And I think here in Clinton, uh, Mr. Panagletti and I spend some time working with the other literacy professionals in the district, and we've tried very hard to uh, do assessments that will help us, have students complete assessments that will give us a picture of who they are as readers and, and thinkers. And then if there are issues that are there, working with them to do some kind of intervention to help bring them along. Okay. So I think classically, if you were to ask me five, ten years ago, what was one of the warning signs of dyslexia, which is one of the issues that has really, I think, become pretty pervasive in, in reading, is that people thought about reversing B's and D's, that, that was, if students did that, it was sort of a warning sign that they were suddenly there. It's not. So let me just <laughs> that. I don't want you to panic, like, oh my gosh, he wrote down instead of bad. Ha! Yeah. There's, no, there's no need to freak out if, if that is. But that can be one of the indicators that are there. So, um, and that could also be a visual problem, which it, it doesn't necessarily just mean that there is um, uh, an issue with dyslexia. But um, what I'm going to show you is a very quick, this is an excerpt of a TED Talk specifically about dyslexia. And I shared this with the Morgan staff when I first started teaching here because I was hearing the word get thrown around and I didn't always know. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> She's so excited she wants to be here. Um, so uh, the word, the term is getting thrown around. So I, I show this to staff to, to spur some conversation. So I'm going to show it to you as well, just to help frame our conversation around. slow? What were those sentences about? 
They're actually a simulation of the experience of dyslexia, designed to make you decode each word. Those with dyslexia experience that laborious pace every time they read. When most people think of dyslexia, they think of seeing letters and words backwards, like seeing B as D and vice versa, or they might think people with dyslexia see saw as was. The truth is, people with dyslexia see things the same way as everyone else. Dyslexia is caused by a phonological processing problem, meaning people affected by it have trouble not with seeing language, but with manipulating it. For example, if you heard the word cat and then someone asked you, remove the C, what word would you have left? At. This can be difficult for those with dyslexia. Given a word in isolation like fantastic, students with dyslexia need to break the word into parts to read it. Fan, tas, tick. Time spent decoding makes it hard to keep up with peers and gain sufficient comprehension. Spelling words phonetically like S-T-I-K for stick and F-R-E-N-S for friends is also common. These difficulties are more widespread and varied than commonly imagined. Dyslexia affects up to one in five people. It occurs on a continuum. One person might have mild dyslexia, while the next person has a profound case of it. Dyslexia also runs in families. It's common to see one family member who has trouble spelling, while another family member has severe difficulty decoding even one-syllable words like catch. The continuum and distribution of dyslexia suggest a broader principle to bear in mind as we look at how the brains of those with dyslexia process language. Neurodiversity is the idea that because all our brains show differences in structure and function, we shouldn't be so quick to label every deviation from the norm as a pathological disorder, or dismiss people living with these variations as defective. People with neurobiological variations like dyslexia, including such creative and inventive individuals as Picasso, Muhammad Ali, Whoopi Goldberg, Steven Spielberg, and Cher, clearly have every capacity to be brilliant and successful in life. So here's the special way the brains of those with dyslexia work. The brain is divided into two hemispheres. The left hemisphere is generally in charge of language and ultimately reading, while the right typically handles spatial activities. FMRI studies have found that the brains of those with dyslexia rely more on the right hemisphere and frontal lobe than the brains of those without it. This means when they read a word, it takes a longer trip through their brain and can get delayed in the frontal lobe. Because of this neurobiological glitch, they read with more difficulty. But those with dyslexia can physically change their brain and improve their reading. With an intensive multi-sensory intervention that breaks the language down and teaches the reader to decode based on syllable types and spelling rules, the brains of those with dyslexia begin using the left hemisphere more efficiently while reading, and their reading improves. The intervention works because it locates dyslexia appropriately as a functional variation in the brain, which naturally shows all sorts of variations from one person to another. Neurodiversity emphasizes this spectrum of brain function in all humans and suggests that to better understand the perspectives of those around us, we should try to not only see the world through their eyes, but understand it through their brains. Within the reading circles, there are trainings that you can go and, and learn some of the techniques. There's different different programs that students um, or that teachers can be trained in to work with students. And I would say that many of our literacy specialists are have been trained in that, especially at the at the at the lower levels um, for younger children to address some of those concerns. So um, 
I would say that within within the, the literacy circles, there there are a few options that people have. Of course, there's competitors and saying, "Oh, you can do sure. these different these different programs." But they've definitely come a lot further than they were when when I was in elementary school. Um, yeah, is this like Orton Gillingham or Wilson or yep. all of those? Precisely. Yeah. So that's so the Wilson program is one that's that's fairly common. The Orton Gillingham is another one that um, can be trained. UConn does workshops that that folks can go to. Um, and, and be specifically trained in using those multi-sensory, multimodal um, ways of, of helping students. So it really gave you a simplified version, but it's, you know, there's, there's a whole lot to it. And what are the, do you have any idea of what the success rates are? I don't. Uh, I, I know that there are different resources. The What Works Clearinghouse, for example, is one that looks at all the research and, and goes in and looks at them. I would imagine that they probably studied um, you know, the, the results within, if you were to go to Orton Gillingham or to the Wilson program, they probably um, have some anecdotal evidence. And I would imagine that as it becomes more and more pervasive in schools, they'll be able to study and, and look at the results. But I would say so far, the success has been, has been um, pretty noticeable. Otherwise, I don't think districts would have spent the, sure. the time right. and the resources around it. Yeah. I just wanted to share that if um, you know someone, who, a child or a family member who's dyslexic, um, there's a beautiful book, thank you, Mr. Fokker mm -hmm. and Patricia Polacco. Um, uh, it's just a beautiful children's book about um, a girl who has dyslexia. The teacher who helped her. Right, and it's semi autobiographical. Yeah. With Patricia Plot over herself Patricia's was amazing. If you don't follow her on Facebook, she yeah. she posts many great things, not just pictures of her cat. Um, but she <laughs> she just has just this great um, this great way about it, and I think her books are just so um, so wonderful because they they so beautifully illustrate some of those really important transitions in life, and that is one of the ones that's that's in there. So. Um, Patricia Polacco, P O L A C C O, might be two L's. It is two L's. L L A C C O. So they're beautifully illustrated books. She she writes and illustrates them. They're um, they're really they're really wonderful. Um, so she's written um, a whole host of, of books. Thundercake is another one of her. My rotten um, redheaded uh, older brother is another one that talks about her relationship with her brother and how that changed over time. She's She's amazing, um, and I think it's she's a great example for for young women as far as their storytelling. But I I have boys that will also push each other out of the way to get to them. So they're great they're great books um, to read. But thank you for so for Jim, just wanted yeah. to add, uh, regarding the the screening for dyslexia. Um, yeah. Our our elementary school reading interventionists are trained to do these screenings to make sure that we pick up on any of those sorts of. Um, learning profiles at an early age and both both Orton Gillingham and the Wilson program um, are what we refer to as scientifically research based interventions that are part of the clearinghouse that have really stood the test of time in, in uh, helping to remediate those reading difficulties including dyslexia so um, by the time kids um, are entering Pearson those types of, of, of decoding issues are definitely screened for and picked up. Mm, not necessarily. Um, I'm sure there's some fine lines. I know they try, but mm -hmm. you also have to champion for your own kid. I mean, sure. It's, mm -hmm. And I think that's that's another message I hope to share with all of you. I'm, I'm glad you did bring that up because I think there are times where, um, and I've worked with students who are really good at at sort of acting the part of looking like they're very they're very literate they participate in class conversations they do all the habits that you expect to see but but oftentimes i think the screenings that are now i think are are being used i hope we're we're catching more and more of those things earlier and earlier so that by the time students get to that age but i i agree that there are also i think physiological changes that children can go through at stages in their life that might that might affect their ability to as, as they were talking about Part of the neuroplasticity, our brain's ability to shape and adapt, as as our brains are developing, there's also things that we couldn't have we couldn't have foreseen before. And I think now, as we become more aware of ADHD and other and other issues, the impact that that has on brain physiology, I think you're absolutely right. And it's not just that one. I'm using that as an example can be things that can um, that can create issues for students the further they get along in their education. So I, I appreciate you bringing that up, and I'm hoping. I'm hoping that it's now addressed, but we can we can talk about that after. Yeah. Okay. 
So, um, so as far as um, tips for families encouraging kids to read at home when they're struggling with reading in school. So this is the thing. Um, very rarely, with the children I've, I've taught, by the time they get to me, they know that they are not the strongest reader or writer. Usually, definitely by the time they're in high school. If students are, are having an issue, they know it. It's not a mystery to them. They're not saying to themselves, oh, I wonder where this came from that I suddenly can't read. It's probably been an underlying piece. But as the reading itself has become more and more challenging over time, I think students start to realize this is a lot more, this is a lot more challenging than it was just a, just a year ago. And so for that, I think a piece of it is that when students come home, the last thing we want to do is, well, you're not a very strong reader, so let's, you're going to sit in that chair and you're going to read that book until you get it. And I think that, that we have to be very, I'm, I'm being funny, but unfortunately, I've, I've known um, families that have had that as their philosophy. Um, and so I want us to be really, um, to be very sensitive to the fact that um, it has to be a school home partnership to help children improve. And so um, just a few things to keep in mind. And I think one of the important pieces, and although we see an incredible sense of urgency, is to try to make it a relaxing and low key um, experience and for a short part of the day. It's not as though, okay, you, you had trouble reading all week, so you're gonna spend the weekend sitting on sitting in the chair reading this book that's that's due on Monday. I don't think that that would create the kind of mindset that we would want the child to have to say, great, I love that I'm being punished by reading, so I'm gonna do it all the time now. It's probably going to create um, some more of an animosity than, than anything else. So keeping in mind that we want it to be sort of an activity. And going back to those first few tips that I put up, as far as doing it together, if the child's just being told, go sit over there and read by yourself, it's creating another sense of isolation. So I'm going to read my book that I, that I would like to read, and if there's, if there's anything I can do to help you with the book that you're reading, you just let me know. Or sitting there and reading the book with them, taking turns, passing the book back and forth so that it's not something that they're doing in isolation. So Jim, a lot of times with really young families with young children, you'll hear parents say, oh, my kid doesn't like to read. Uh -huh. What are tips that, right at that critical age, you know, like, when they, like when they're still on your lap and they're still you know, able to read with you, mm -hmm. are there tips that you recommend to kind of change that mindset, both on the parent's perspective also? Right. So then you can look at the interval of reading. So it might be that the child is OK for the first five, 10 minutes. And then after a certain period of time is their attention, which is prone to do at that age. So if you're selecting a children's book that, it, that is incredibly dense with a lot of language, it can just be that the child is frustrated because of the, 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 the sheer length. And maybe the language might be a little complex. I don't know if you've looked at some children's books lately, but you know they've really tried to expand and do that. So kind of looking at whether or not the text is developmentally appropriate for the child at that time, just because it is a picture book doesn't necessarily mean that all ones are created equal. So when children are still young enough to sit on your lap and read, I would think you want books that, they are, um, that are relatively short in duration. You want to look at the, the topic and see if it's something that engages them. As children start to, you know, to read. If, if, if Timmy likes dinosaurs, I would recommend going to the library and finding every children's color, you know, every children's picture book that's on dinosaurs. So look at something that's within their area of interest. I think um, within that as well is looking at the time of day that you're reading as well. I think oftentimes we think of it only as a bedtime activity, but that's when children are exhausted from, the, from everything else they, they've encountered that day. So I know that some families read before, before dinner, so while dinner's getting ready, that can be an activity that can be done right there in the kitchen so that it's not always at the very end of the day. So I think there are, there are a few different um, strategies that I would suggest with that. I don't know if there's any others that any, anyone else has tried out. My children are very young too, and I've noticed that from when I was little, there's way more picture books available. So, like, um, Goodnight Gorilla is one of their absolute That's favorites. Nice it's got, like, five words in the whole book. <laughs> but we can each take turns. And you act it out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and that yeah. still captures their attention after years. Sure. Yeah. And you read it over and over and over yeah. and over and over and over yeah. again. And I, that's one of the best things someone told me. 
You know, just keep repeating. Oh, they just, like, just want to read it again. Read it again. Yeah, <laughs> read it again. Let them develop a favorite. Mm -hmm. That was a really good piece. Pop on pop. That was mine. Well, one of so many times. One of the things that um, my my daughter enjoyed when my mother would come and um, visit is my daughter loved um, these certain series of books, and one reason why she loved it is because my mother would sit down with her, and mother would read one page, and my daughter would read the next page, and they shared the book back and forth, and mm -hmm. each page, each one. So it just, it drew, you know, my mother and her together, plus they were reading together. And, right. it was really and I think that that's, that helps, I think the, the nurturing relationship that's there is also what helps to build that, and, and seeing, grandma as a, as a person who is a storyteller, who is a person who shares what I love. Uh, we, we share this together. I think there are lots of things. When I think, as you were telling that story, I was thinking back to my own. When my grandmother, when we would go up to New Hampshire and spend summers with my grandparents, there would be The Pokey Little Puppy was one of the books that my grandmother would read. And I think for many of us, we have those literacy experiences that really help that. So, um, and I think encouraging other family members, because if they're only hearing from us, that can be another piece too. So if you're lucky enough to have grandparents, aunts, and uncles around, you know that's what I try to do as an uncle with my niece and nephew is to read to them. The, for really young children, you know, first grade, early second grade, those Gerald and Piggy books, uh -huh. because the there's a lot of illustrations, and he manages to get expression, so much expression in the faces of these two characters. And kids love them because they're all hysterical. Right. And you know, when I was working at Joel, those were probably, you know, for the girls that had the fairy books. But if you combine them, those were the most the books that were taken out the most. Absolutely. At Joel. Funny, had friends who were dif you know different from each other. It's if you have young kids, they're right. they're really great books. And this is where your librarian can really come in handy with, with things like that. If you say to them, can you give me a couple of books that fly off the shelf or the ones that are, they know the frequent flyer books that are, that are taken out more than any other. If you can't spot them on the shelf because they're almost worn, you know, uh, threadbare, then that will give you an indication of that. that the, um, I love this idea of the, the sharing with the families, the larger families, and just thinking back to this slide, mm -hmm. the struggling kids. So. Um, one thing that I think is really great is that uh, my husband's father um, brings New York Times articles and Audubon articles, and he sends them to the kids in the mail. Thought you would be interested in this. Like, look, the moon, there's going to be a super moon. Mm -hmm. And I, I never asked him to do that, but I thought, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Because because that's the next level of reading that they're not prepared to do quite yet. But sure. um, he's bridging the gap for that. Mm -hmm. It's amazing what our families can do. My mother was so excited the day she figured out that my nephew was old enough for Ranger Rick. She got so excited. She said, yes, I know what I'm getting him for Christmas. It's a subscription. So he can start reading about backyard animals as well. Yeah. So I think having that piece and, and, and seeing um, a literate family, I think, goes a very long way for, for children to, to model some of those things. So just a few more tips on, on this. Um, you know, sharing what you're reading with um, with children as well. You know, oh, this is what you're reading at school. Well, this is the book that 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 I've been reading. It's a part of my book club. I think is really um, really great. And this is the other thing too. I think we think that we only have to share. Oftentimes, I'll dog ear if I'm reading something and it's a particularly well written passage. I think the teacher in me says, oh, I could use this someday. So I'm going to keep it. I'm going to keep an eye on this. But sharing with with children, what are some of the interesting parts of the books that you're reading? Um, and, and keeping those things in mind too. Um, there are lots of ways to draw children in. We, we listed some of them before, but riddle books, passages from Sports Illustrated, newspaper stories, which is really interesting. Um, I reached out to the other literacy professionals in the district, and one of the ones they said is, the Shoreline Times can be a great way for students. They can read about people they know and, and things that are going on in the community. And I think even if we aren't super jazzed to read, Take it till you make it with your kids. Show them. You know, uh, I think sometimes it's just like, yay! I can, and even though we might be physically and mentally exhausted from the day that we've had, but showing your own enjoyment with them. And I and on that, one other piece is 
they talked about the genetic component with dyslexia. I think also, if your child is struggling, be honest. If you had struggles as well, tell them. It wasn't easy for me either. I think we make them feel like, well, it's it, good luck, kiddo. I hope it gets better. That's not necessarily going to give them as much hope as, well, you know, Uncle Dave really struggled too. And I know that his teachers did many things with him until he was able to, to read. And now, you know, so giving them some, some hope and, and those pieces, I think, are an important one to keep there. Can I really reinforce that? Like, yeah. My own child, like, he's sure. being super positive when he's had struggles with his schoolwork and say, well, you know, and, and again, he's, he, he's had a, he has a diagnosed learning disability, to be able to sort of say, okay, well, your brain works differently, and that's okay, and we're going to figure out ways to help you mm -hmm. figure out new ways of, of doing your work. And he's responded really well and has been really resilient. Good. So. I'm glad. I, thank you for sharing that. Um, and so, this is probably one of the most key ones, and I have a whole other slide just dedicated to this one point. But you don't want to be heavy handed about it, especially if your child is, is being turned off at school, whether it's because the, the academic work is, is, is really challenging for them or whatever it is. Keep in mind that the home reading should be fun, engaging. Um, and family-oriented with that. Um, and the other piece, which is, yeah, I think one that all of us will say, it wasn't as good as the movie, or the, the movie wasn't as good as the book. But if the kid really does like a movie, I think one of the great things is that they are novelizing a lot of them now. You went to go see Finding Dory, you liked it? Great, let's go to the library and get the, the story of Finding Dory. It will help the students with the familiarity that they've already had. Um, so, this piece of advice is, I think, a really important one. And it talks about um, engaging students in things that they're interested in. I think if a student um, or child has an interest that is something that really keeps them going, that is going to make them want to persevere because they want to learn about it. And so the way back, as they say, is through material that's intensely interesting to them. So I think sometimes we get concerned if our student, if our children, sorry, I keep saying students, if the kids are only reading Matt Christopher books, because that's all he's reading, Matt Christopher books about sport. Guess what? There's so much language, vocabulary, and things that are there. Let them, let them read those books. If that's what's going to, to keep them engaged, I think that it, it serves a very valuable purpose um, for them as well. So a couple of things to not do. Um, if the child is struggling reading aloud, don't force them to continue struggling. That's the piece that I really couldn't get my head around. Is This is a really tough thing, so you're going to keep doing it. Um, we used to joke that the beatings will continue until morale improves. You, know, you don't want to have that happen. So you want them to, to enjoy what's happening. So don't force them. And this is where we were talking about before, trading off. Reading the book aloud to the child first, and then read it together. It can send a really an incredibly positive message. And it's supposed to feel good. So when it does, when that reading begins to, um, begins to seep in, and they, they build their skills, whether that's through school or practice at home or a combination of both, it's going to help them instill those good habits in them. And to keep in mind that we repeat the things that are pleasurable. So if it's a pleasurable experience, guess what? They're going to want to come back and, 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 and do a little more and, and think about it a little bit more. And this is one where, I'll never forget, there was a parent who came up to me at one point and said, I'm so proud. Whenever they're back, I make them read. And I'm like, no! So please, 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 never make reading a punishment. So it should be enjoyable and encouraged. Not go to your room and read a book. Guess what? They're not going to read. When they go to their room, it's not going to happen. So don't, don't think, you know, I, I, I would say, um, and if you have, this is a judgment-free zone, what happens here, what happens here if, you've ever, if you've ever had that as a form of punishment before, you're going to go sit in a chair in the corner and you're going to read that book. Okay. It's okay. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna give you a pass. But I think if students perceive it that way, that's going to be a really hard way of thinking for them to get out of. So please, um, encourage it. Make it something positive. Make it a reward. Um, you know, when students reach an accomplishment, great. Let's go to the library and pick out a new book when they reach some kind of milestone so that they see that there is tremendous value in, um, in getting those uh, pieces. So for you, if you've had um, a, a struggling reader in your family, as some of you have surfaced here, you know, being hopeful. I think if we approach it with a pessimistic attitude, 
It, that in and of itself is not going to make the situation any better. We have to become strong advocates for our children to know that we want to advocate for them so that they can get the most that they need and, and having that. And then, you know, the other piece is to, kind of goes along with my earlier point, is to not let our own anxieties spill over into the kids. Did you read that yet? Are you really having trouble? What's going on? Well, do you really understand what you're reading? Oh, no, no, no. This is horrible. I gotta make sure I talk to your teacher. You know, if, if, if we, if we let that seep, seep through, I don't think it's going to create a very calm, nurturing environment for, for our kids. And so we want them to have, um, we want them to see um, the pleasure that's there. So not showing them our own anxieties. And if they, are, if they are struggling, there are strategies that you can use to help, to help them. So some of the things that we've talked about tonight, I think also talking with your child's teacher. So one of the things that's wonderful as a resource here is we have so many adults in the school district that are experts at the level that they teach. They've been teaching second grade for many years. They've been working in, in first grade classrooms. They've seen many of the things that work. And I think sometimes we think that because I had the literacy professional hat on that I suddenly was endowed with all the knowledge that a 20 year veteran has, that's not true. I mean, many of them have been really working with, with children and have helped them push through um, many of those developmental stages for them. So keeping those lines of communication open, I think are really, really important. So I want to acknowledge that my present, this next piece of my presentation and a lot of what it went into the earlier piece um, came as a result of the other um, members of the Clinton Public School Literacy Team. So Jennifer Kip Kelly, who is brand new at Elliott, as well as Lauren and Holly, gave me some recommendations to share with all of you tonight. So my last piece is going to be some shout outs to some really great um, authors and, and series to keep in mind. So that you're not writing them all down um, furiously, I can share this with all of you. We can put a, a copy of this up on the uh, Clinton Public Schools website. I do. You have treats? Well, do you think any of your kids are allergic to this? Oh. Oh, any of It does say net and something, whatever, free. Um, and they are fine. No allergies. Yes. Oscar has a peanut allergy. Oh, that's a peanut allergy. Yeah, Oscar has a peanut allergy. But he knows to ask. Okay. So. I think it says, what's the main and a not free facility? Is that, yeah, yeah. so they shouldn't. They shouldn't he should be fine. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for coming out, We appreciate it. <laughs> A great kid. We're very lucky to have her here in the morning. So, so that you don't have to write all these down if you're, if you're seeing there. But some of these were series that uh, were around when I was there. They're oldies but goodies, and some of them are relatively new ones. Like Alien in a Pocket was not around when I was in elementary school. So when we look, there are all kinds of um, books that are really geared toward um, first grade into early second grade. So there's some ones that are there. Frog and Toad was pretty much that's a great one that's, that's still around. So. Um, working with students on there, but there are also um, books that are going to be on this list that I really was relying on the knowledge of my peers to really help me um, make some recommendations. So the gentleman that wrote the um, the bad kitty books was just yeah. Agile. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Nick, yes, yeah. that's right. She yeah. she written that in, and she, yeah. she actually put that in as a little note. By the way, he just came to Joel. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I didn't want you to feel bad. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. And you could have bought books and, and, and had it autographed. Look at that. Yeah. So yeah, so there's a whole bunch. So they, they created now box sets, and this is this is the other the other piece with this. Many of the one many of the books that are listed here are books that are the first in a series. And so I found for me, and many of you have, um, had talked about how Harry Potter sort of lit that fire. I think that there are so many series now that are out that I've seen students just plow through. If they find an author they really like, plow through. There are so many books that they've written, and there's been a tremendous amount of research about just exposure, more vocabulary, more concepts. All of those things will help children tremendously as they as they advance in their, in their grades. The other thing for young readers, too, are good yeah. is that you can get so many other things to go with the characters, too. Like you can get stuffed animals, you can get pajamas, and you know other things that help them. Yeah, yeah. mass marketing is great. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, um, these, and it's great because it's not just Disney characters. They actually have, you can go in. At R.J. Julia, for example, they have a whole, a whole cart with all different uh, literary characters, stuffed animals. So it's great to see. Um, so again, for second grade into third, you see that there are some other ones, again, series that were around but, but not. A little plug for, um, for Jane Goodall. Um, those are the biographies, and so they have who is and who was. They're great, um, very vividly illustrated uh, stories about um, famous folks, and so there are ones here for second to third. 
For third and to fourth, um, why not wrap it right into the big Star Wars uh, trend that are going on? There are so many now, so these are origami um, books that use um, characters from the Star Wars series to, um, to help tell stories, so another graphic novel kind of piece, as is the Jedi Academy. My nephew, Aiden, is very much into the Jedi Academy. And uh, the Geronimo Stilton books. Has anybody read those with, with your kids? Yeah? So, you tried? <laughs> Okay, um, so um, again, and, and I think with my nephew, even though he's in second grade, these were still books that he was engaged in, so it doesn't necessarily mean that they're hard and fast, that they have to be at a certain grade level. Um, and then as far as fourth through eighth grade, um, they were, this was a recommendation, was looking at Harbor News as an, as an option, um, and Shoreline Times as, as a piece there. There's the American Adventure series, which I think that um, many teachers are using in Pretty much anything that Rick Reardon has written are books that kids are really, really enjoying. So now, when I read him, it was just this part of the bookshelf, and now he's decided he wants to take up the rest of the shelf at the library. Um, so he's written quite prolifically about, um, about um, mythological characters. So great things that are there. R.L. Stein is someone who, um, for those of you who have young gentlemen who like things gross and spooky and strange, um, has written lots of books um, that are on, on those. So I just, I have to give it to him that I think that they're really engaging. Kids really do like them. Even though we might cringe at some of the, at some of the titles, um, I think that there are, there are lots of uh, things. Please don't, if they do really like the Rotten School things, please disclaimer, I, you didn't get the idea from me. Um, <laughs> I don't want them to uh, think that that sort of represents everything. But they're great, they're great books, um, so why not? As far as middle school recommendations, uh, Neil Schusterman, who I first got to know through his book, The Schwa Was Here, has written the Unwind series, which has become another really interesting dystopian future uh, series. And so Unwind was the first one was there. Neil actually came and spoke at RJ Julia. I got to shake his hand. I was so excited. Um, <laughs> because my kids really did enjoy reading him. So to be able to meet and make that connection was a really great um, piece. Obviously, the, the Harry Potter books um, have, have gotten a few shout outs tonight. But looking at the fact that realistic fiction for students um, and historical fiction, so I mentioned the Watsons go to Birmingham. Um, Christopher Paul Curtis is just an amazing author who writes with such a genuine voice. His name is actually on the front side of the, of the, um, of the handout. Um, he's just an amazing, an amazing author. And the audiobooks, which I'm going to get to in a second, are just phenomenal for his books. Um, they're, they're, really, they're really great. Um, and so, some other recommendations. As far as some other authors that are really um, that are really great, I actually have a copy. If you haven't seen the one and only Ivan, I'll send it around. Um, if you want to take a quick sneak peek, Catherine Applegate um, is the author. KT Camillo wrote *The Tiger Rising*, *The Tale of Despero*, and a very long title that ends with *Edward Tulane*. He's a little stuffed rabbit. There's a great adventure from there. Sharon Draper came and spoke at Southern. It was so wonderful to hear. Um, she wrote Out of My Mind, which is an incredible book. Has anybody read Out of My Mind? An incredibly powerful story um, about disability that can really help um, students get a better understanding of, of what, that's, what that can be like. And she just published, her newest book is called Stella by Starlight, about a young girl who learns to read when it's illegal. Her family is, you know, they're African American, they're living in the South. Um, she was very upset when the company um, did the cross burning as the cover image of her book. She did such a small part, but everybody said, oh, it's about these young children resisting against the Klan. And she said, it's so much more than that. It's about a long, young girl who wants to read so badly that she learns to read by starlight. It's a beautiful book. Um, so please, if you haven't yet, um, give it a read. And then uh, Paul Vol Vol Pony wrote his book, The Final Four, another um, sports-oriented um, author that has really gained some notoriety of late um, that are there. In terms of nonfiction, you were mentioning before, if you've never seen any of Seymour Simon's books, you've probably seen the covers at the library because they're all, they are such interesting pieces. He's written um, with the Smithsonian and he has great, engaging nonfiction books that are really interesting, um, filled with all kinds of information and, and, are, and are incredibly engaging for children. So I'm um, going to give a shout out to, uh, to Seymour as well. To talk about audiobooks, it, it, this came up earlier, and I just want to um, put out there that I don't want you to think it's an altogether bad thing if children are using audiobooks. I think using audiobooks in conjunction with the written text can be very powerful for students. 
they're really engaged, I find. Oftentimes we think that it's become very passive, that they're not really having to do anything. But it really is engaging for students to be able to read the audiobook. It's modeling fluency for them so they can hear what professional, engaging uh, reading sounds like. So keeping that in mind. It is helping to build students' comprehension skills so that they have more of an understanding, uh, especially if students are struggling and they're word readers where they're reading individual words. Being able to hear it in its natural form is a really great model for students, so keeping that in mind um, is an option as well. And I think that a piece for us to keep in mind is that it's just as important for us to talk and share what we're learning instead of just saying, okay, you've read it, great, turn the radio off, okay, let's go back to listening to Taylor Swift. <laughs> Taking a minute to talk, have a little bit of a discussion about what you've listened to, I think is a really important component uh, with that. So there is a tremendous uh, potential there. As you can imagine now, there are many books that have been written, and I just found some ones that are relatively recent um, that have been written, they're on the front side of your handout, are just some books about looking at some of the engaging topics. We really didn't get into digital literacy too much, but pieces about engaging the reluctant reader by using technology um, is a new book that just came out uh, last year. Um, another book on reaching your, your reluctant reader, there's one about, there's a book that's very inspiring by Jeff Gunnis about how he worked with his son to become an unstoppable reader, um, pretty inspirational. And then another book club, Help Your Child Grow from Reluctant to an Enthusiastic Reader. So these are all books that I would, you know, see if they're available at your library. I should have done my homework and see if they were available down the road at, at the Henry Carter Hill Library, but, um, but there you go. Um, Another, as I was doing some research for tonight, I found an interesting website. It's called WeNeedDiverseBooks.org. And I thought it was really interesting because one of the features they had are, if you like Stregonona, why not read Noodle Magic next? So it's looking at books that have sort of become a part of the pantheon and giving us some opportunities to look at some more diverse book selections to share with our children. Another is Joey Pigs Loses Control. The Joey Pigs books are about a child who's struggling with, uh, with um, ADHD. And so there are other books that um, are recommended in that, in that vein um, as well. And um, so this is one of the features that they have, is they give you a book and then another recommendation if the kids like it um, to move on to another one. Um, so I thought it was another interesting website to share. Typically, when we're having this conversation, oftentimes um, parents are focusing on boys that are reluctant readers. It's not that it is a one-way street, but I found that it tends to work that way. So I just wanted to share really quickly, John Sheska um, is a really interesting author. He's famous for The True Story of the Three Little Pigs, and he wrote um, a new very honor book called The Stinky Cheese Man and Other Fairly Stupid Tales. So that sort of gave him notoriety. But John started a movement um, that was looking at inspiring young boys, especially, to, to get reading. And so, some of the historical fiction I used to share with my students, because they're relatively short, are the Time Warp Trio books. He wrote a whole series where the boys go back in time, so they'll look at the Knights of the Kitchen Table, the Not-So-Jolly Roger, the Good, the Bad, and the Goofy. And so he takes historical fiction and, and implants these three boys in them. So good for, for, young, um, for young guys in particular. But he's also um, written a couple of books uh, again, about um, books for guys. So I'll send a couple around that I have with me, um, where uh, John reaches out to uh, other authors and asks them to contribute books that he's uh, written for. So the first one was Guys Write for Guys Read, um, and it's all about authors writing about being boys. He also wrote another book called Knucklehead about his childhood. And as a result, he's also published a series of books that are collections of sports stories, funny stories, true stories, terrifying tales, really short, engaging uh, stories that, that children can, can share and read together. Um, and in terms of writing advice, Ralph Fletcher, who's another author that I use in the courses that I teach, um, wrote a couple of books specifically about working with boys and working on their writing development. So I know the time is focused on reading, but I think the writing piece of it is just as important for us. So. Um, sharing that as well. And I don't want to keep you too much longer, so that's really all that I, um, all that I had to, um, to say, but I wanted to give you some opportunity to ask some questions if you have it, or say, thanks Jim, we've got to go home now. Um, that's fine too, I won't, I won't take it personally. So I hope that what I've shared tonight um, has been helpful. So uh, questions, yes? Right.
where I was heading back to was because you did spend a fair amount of time on dyslexia. Yes. Um, if at what age should we be concerned if I'll just be straightforward. My daughter who is in sixth grade at school doesn't spell very well. Uh -huh. And you know, I kept thinking as she got better at reading and she's doing you know, mm -hmm. well with reading, but when she's writing it's it's a total different story. So I think for, for many students, um, I don't know. It's really tough to say that there's a definitive age that it would be cause for concern. And my mind sort of goes in two, in two different directions. One, I think that we've become an increasingly digital society. And so a lot of the resources students will have will be able to assist them with, with spelling and writing. Um, with that, I would say to have conversations with, with their, you know, with, with them and then with the teachers at school too to, to see that. I don't know that there's necessarily definitive, you know, uh, break point for there, but for some, I think there's even adults who will say, I'm not, I'm not the greatest speller. Um, and so learning some of the tips, the, the, the um, you know, some of the strategies that would work well, I think could be one that would help her, you know, as, as she advances. But I don't know that there's a definitive, we can, we can talk a little bit more, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. Um, about it. But I appreciate it because I think it's, it is a piece of, you know, I, when when would be the time to? Right, and she doesn't care. So. Okay, right. Okay, well that's the other piece too. All right. So anything else? Um, what do you feel about e-books? Mm -hmm. You know, consuming books that way. I think I think exposure is really what is absolutely most critical and important. So for students, I personally still very much like having the book. I I've gotten a Kindle. I find that I do use it, but I don't, I will, I would never pick a Kindle over this. But I think for children, whatever is the, the most preferable media for them, I say is the one that you go with. And so many libraries now have where you, you don't necessarily have to, um, you know, pony up money to buy books on Kindle. Many libraries now um, have the ability for you to rent books for a shorter period of time using Overdrive and other, other pieces. So, I think it's it's a it's a valuable resource that's there, and I think we see now with Chromebooks being used more and more often, and I think in the college level, I think digital books are really the way the way things you know where things are headed. So I think if students are more comfortable reading that way, I think it's it's something that we would as long as if they're engaged in the reading, I say we provide them with the, the method to do that. It's a real nitty gritty question. Sure. Um, so I have two readers, which is great. Um, and uh, sometimes they'll be reading something and they decide they don't like this book anymore. Uh -huh. Now, when I don't like a book anymore, and I teach English, I'm done. I'm sure. <laughs> end of time. Mm -hmm. My husband is like, you must see it through to the end. <laughs> now, I don't really care what these Here, we can go back to that other slide. <laughs> the marital therapy. Yeah. Um, I don't really care what they do. Am I being invited to yeah, settle the, the argument? <laughs> it's, like, it's like when they call talk. Talk yeah, and say, can you just tell my husband it's okay if I drive with the trunk yeah, open? No, anyway. okay. I'm not worried about what they do long term, but I'm interested in what message it sends right. to say about sticking with the story. So my mind sort of goes in two different directions. Yeah. That. I think, yes, we want to inspire stick to it yeah. But if the story isn't engaged, like we've all read books that are just not well written and just don't resonate with us. Why would we want to see it through all the way to the end? So I don't think if if we were to say give that message for five consecutive books, okay, it's okay to throw them away. I think that, but my piece is always to have the conversation. What is it about this book that makes you feel like you've had enough? And I think when you hear some of the explanation, that will give you an indication whether or not it's just I'm I'm not interested, or there's it's it's something else. Um, that, that's underlying. So I think that conversation piece with everything is so important. And to get kids to talk about the books that they're reading, we'll say, yeah, it's good, no, it wasn't. But to delve in and ask them, what is it about that book that you don't really like, I think will give you a lot more information and bolster your argument. Mm -hmm. There you go. <laughs> so, well, Jim Messina said, right, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Anything else? Yeah. Well, I just have a book recommendation, and I sure. probably everybody has one of these, but a book that I just love for boys about third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade is a book called Love That Dog. Mm. Do you know what? Sharon Preach. Sharon yeah. Preach. And it's about boys writing poetry. And the, it's like in the form of a journal, like a diary. And he starts out like, 
No, I can't. I don't, boys don't write poetry. Yeah, boys don't like write poetry. poetry. Right. And then over the course of the book, he learns more and he shares about a sad thing that happened in his life and then actually meets a poet and is very, it's just so good. Right. Uh, because it's such a boy's voice. It's right. such a good... And it's Sharon Creech who wrote Walk Two Moons and some right. other great books. Right. Um, and she also wrote a follow-up to that book called Hate That Cat. So Love That Dog <laughs> is yellow and Hate That Cat is in red. Um, and it's and it's very much about that. It's so, like, again, it picks up and he just says, you know, I really hate cats. I don't. I think my teacher likes them and I don't know why. It's like the opening poem. And then again, it tells the story in poetic form as his as his um, abilities um, grow in the Right. So. Thank you so much. Yeah. 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 Thanks for coming, and everybody, thanks for your and engaging and thought-provoking questions. And um, just wanted to invite everybody on December 6th, the PTA is sort of having like a holiday night out. Um, so for 20 bucks, we're all going to Clinton Country Club and just sort of relax and maybe just like ground it. I mean, it's a great deal for 20 bucks and, you know, you get great conversation. So you can kind of, I think you can come the door if you want or um, you can stay up on our website. So everyone's more than welcome. And I always say, like, these are just great people to have conversations with. So about everything and we're all in the same boat. But thank you, This was very important. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for having me.